Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the Social Media Regulation, the new frontier in the fight for civil rights. My name is Clint Odom. I'm the Senior Vice President for Policy and Advocacy at the National Urban League. We have two special guests today that will kick us off. Uh, you will know these people by virtue of the work that they do in the space of social media regulation and policy. Senator Ron Wyden is the senior Democratic Senator from Oregon and the co-author of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Although the Senator did not invent the internet, it is no overstatement to say that the law he is responsible for has much to do with the success of the internet as we know it today. Over the past few months, the internet defining 1996 telecommunications law has become a target of considerable legislative interest, both in the regulatory realm and the legislative realm. So we thought it important to get some perspective from none other than the Senator himself. Next, we'll be joined by Federal Communications Commissioner Jeffrey Starks. In his short time on the commission, he's proven himself to be a champion of broadband access and the promise of broadcasting and the internet to give a voice to those who need to be heard. He's been a great friend of the National Urban League movement and has some definite thoughts on the role of government in content selection and moderation. So we are excited to be able to hear from him today. After those remarks, we'll get right into the panel discussion. Thank you for being here, and I'd like to thank our Urban Solutions Council for their generosity in helping us to put on informative programming like the one you will watch today. Senator? Big thanks to the National Urban League for holding this very timely discussion. Back in the 1990s, when Congressman Chris Cox and I wrote Section 230, I thought it would be useful in promoting free speech and innovation online. I never imagined there would be a time when the president would be using social media to call for its repeal because he was angry that Twitter wouldn't let him lie about voting by mail. Now, Section 230 says that the user is responsible for what they post online. That means that a website is able to take down third party content that is false or racist without being bogged down with lawsuits claiming that they're biased against conservatives. And it's a shield that allows users to speak without being silenced by powerful institutions. Because of that shield, Section 230 has made a tremendous difference in allowing websites to amplify voices that were not traditionally featured on TV or in the big newspapers. Just look at the Black Lives Matter movement. So many of the cases of unjust use of force against Black Americans have come to light as a result of videos posted to social media and not a single Me Too post accusing powerful people of wrongdoing would be allowed on a moderated platform without Section 230. Or just look at how black journalists have used Twitter to call out their management on the coverage of police violence. Without Section 230, sites would have strong incentives to go one of two ways, either sharply limit what users can post, and they would do that so as to avoid being sued, or to stop moderating altogether. Then there would be a lot more false, dangerous content out there, from revenge porn, to posts that support white supremacy. Now, I want to point out as we start this discussion that Section 230 does not protect the big tech companies 
against federal crimes. And the Ninth Circuit correctly ruled that it didn't stop a local government in California from enforcing civil rights laws against roommates.com for its role in creating discriminatory ads. That said, I definitely believe the big tech, tech companies need to do better, much better at policing the content on their platforms. They've spent years doing a terrible job of addressing discriminatory ads, Holocaust denial, and all kinds of racism. Now it's clear that the companies have given far too little attention to civil rights advocates or to the impact of their decisions on the black community. In part, my guess is they did it because they were afraid of criticism from the far right and because of a lack of representation, especially at the highest level of these companies. It's also clear that the administration and the Congress have paid far too little attention on how technology policy is gonna impact groups that don't hold the major levers of power. So as Congress tries to rein in the technology companies, my focus is making sure there are real solutions and not just band-aids and empty promises. That has often been the case with politicians proposing repealing or changing 230 as somehow a solution to basically everything that ails society. But when these bills became law, the results end up hurting people who aren't in power. SESTA-FOSTA, one bill, which changed 230 with the goal of stopping sex trafficking, has ended up doing nothing to protect victims or bring sex traffickers to justice. All it's really done is driven sex work to the dark web and the dark alleys. And by all accounts, violence against sex workers has skyrocketed. Then there's the Earn It Act, recently passed by the Judiciary Committee, which takes basically a similar approach to child sexual abuse materials. There's no doubt in my mind that if you pass that, it will lead to a similar result as that sex trafficking bill. It would actually make it hard, harder to catch the monsters who create and spread this vile child sex abuse material online. When Congress writes laws restricting speech, it's inevitably the least powerful members of our society who pay the price. Not only will companies over moderate, they're gonna do it in an uneven way. And automation is not a panacea. A study last year showed that when technology companies wrote an algorithm to try to stop hate speech, they ended up actually flagging black Americans' posts at a higher rate. So the tech companies surely have to do better. And that is why I've teamed up with Senator Cory Booker Congresswoman Yvette Clark and others to go after biased algorithms. We wrote the Algorithm Accountability Act, which would require the companies to study the algorithms they use, identify bias in their systems, and fix any discrimination or bias they find. That's the kind of bill that can make a real difference and I was proud to go in on it with Senator Booker and Congresswoman Yvette Clark. So there's a lot of work to do to ensure technological advancements don't just reinforce the inequalities and biases that exist today. 
And I especially want to work very closely with all of you at the Urban League to make sure that you are front and center in that discussion. I've always felt that real change doesn't start in Washington, D.C. and trickle down. It starts at the grassroots and then, in effect, comes up as people in politics see how strongly folks feel in their communities. So I look forward to working with you. I think the Urban League is making a huge difference in so many areas of our society. And I especially look forward to having the opportunity to have your counsel, have your ideas, and to collaborate uh, on Section 230. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much to Mark Morial and the National Urban League for inviting me to speak with you all here today. Online communications have become the cornerstone for how we gain access to critical information, learn about the viewpoints of others, and stay connected with our community. Joined with other leaders, Mr. Morial and I recently published an op-ed together in Essence, discussing broadband connectivity as a civil right, creating haves and have-nots in our community and our country that impact our economy healthcare, education, and perhaps most fundamentally, our democracy. Thank you for our shared voice on that critical issue, Mr. Morial. And the one before us here today is just as central. I'm grateful uh, that a historic civil rights organization like National Urban League, which has a unique position in this debate, is weighing in through a public forum. If you've spent any time on Twitter lately, uh, you've probably seen President Trump calling for the repeal of Section 230, the law that keeps websites from being liable for content that their users post. Section 230 has been on the books for more than 20 years, but President Trump seems to have gotten interested because he thinks, misguidedly, that repealing it would stop Twitter from fact-checking his false and misleading tweets about important things like voting by mail. Earlier this year, the president ordered the Commerce Department to petition the FCC for rules clarifying Section 230 in ways that would make it harder for companies to combat misinformation, including from the president online. And so let's be clear. Uh, this was legally unsound and politically motivated from the very start. It represents a clear attempt to work the refs at the very time when his own political future is on the line. Last week, the chairman of the FCC decided to accept the president's invitation and start the process of adopting those rules. The timing is damaging and telling. We are in the midst of an election. By last Thursday, I don't have to tell you, more than 17 million Americans had already voted and various states and counties across the country are setting records for voter turnout simply as a matter of process. Now is not the time to undertake this rulemaking on this path. I see a dark cloud over online free speech that will cast its lingering shadow over our elections. And now to the law. Section 230's drafters envision, though maybe not with perfect clarity, uh, everything from cat videos to combating police violence. They also recognize that not all of those spaces needed to be unlimited as a free-for-all. Section 230 ultimately sought to promote individual contributions and content moderation. With that framework in place, the internet has supported flourishing social movements, robust civic engagement, and diverse voices. Yet, at the same time, that vibrant marketplace does not only see sunshine. To get to those valuable conversations, we too frequently have to wade through hate speech, disinformation, voter suppression, threats of violence, and other harmful content. Social media platforms can magnify those problems and they can exacerbate discrimination in education, employment, housing, lending, and voting. These are not merely theoretical issues. As Spencer Overton, president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies has said, there is a real question about whether social media companies will address their own systemic shortcomings and fully embrace civil rights principles. And against that backdrop, many members of Congress have proposed different approaches to changing that balance. Congress is the right place for this debate, and it's important to remember that legislators are not writing a on a blank slate. It is the Constitution, not simply a statute, that protects private actors' right to label, moderate, and otherwise control speech on their own platforms. And so in closing, I'll end where I began. Make no mistake about it, this is an issue that is part of the crossroads facing our democracy right now. 
These are not trivial issues. How we protect our democracy from election interference online, how we protect our women, especially black women who experience violence and abuse at an exponential rate on these platforms, and how to curb white supremacists and the content that they have that continues to thrive online. As ever, I'm glad that the National Urban League is leading the way on engaging with these critical questions. I look forward to standing shoulder to shoulder on that long and steady march towards making our community safer, stronger, and more prosperous. Thank you. So the Senator and the Commissioner have done a great job of framing the issues at stake for communities of color and civil rights advocates. So will the internet continue to be a place where people can exchange ideas on platforms like Facebook, post content and alert people to convenings like this one on Twitter, broadcast a briefing like this for free on YouTube, and for Black Lives Matter or voter registration groups to organize online and press for change? Will content moderation decisions on disinformation, intimidation, hate speech, voter suppression, et cetera, be allowed to stand? Or can we expect to see one day the Department of Justice bringing lawsuits against content moderation decisions that are made by the platforms? So this is where we find ourselves. And I want to start with Kate. Uh, Kate, you are a senior legislative counsel with the ACLU. Uh, you have been following these issues really since their inception. Can you give us a little background on how 230 came about and what were the constitutional uh, precepts that were kind of um, propelling uh, the adoption of Section 230? Sure, very happy to. Thanks, Clint, and thanks to National Urban League for convening this. I, I'm, I'm honored to be here and, and thrilled to be talking with all of you and, and with this esteemed panel. Um, to answer your question, you know, the First Amendment protects our right to free speech, to assembly, uh, to petition the government for a redress of our grievances and, and, and the freedom of the press. Right. And, and that's setting aside, obviously, the freedom of religion clauses. Um, but that's that's basically what the First Amendment protects. However, there are categories of speech that fall outside of the ambit of first of the First Amendment. They include obscenity, incitement to violence, and and true threats. Those are all pretty fact specific categories that require specific examination of, of each instance of their occurrence to determine whether they did fall outside the ambit of the First Amendment. When you're deciding whether that speech could be punished by the government, um, and it, again, you know, the First Amendment restricts the government's ability. To, to censor us. Um, and, you know, at common law, since Section 230 essentially protects platforms for, um, for presenting, publishing, or distributing the speech of others, we have to go back to prior to 230, you know, courts were, were examining what the common law principles were as they applied to this new technology known as the internet. Um, and at common law, publishers are strictly liable for the speech that they publish. The New York Times is liable for the four corners of the New York, of what is published in the in the paper version of the New York Times, including the advertisements, including you know, speech provided by third parties. However, distinguishing the the New York Times as a publisher from, for example, a bookseller or a bookstore. Bookstores are what are known as distributors of, of speech, and they are only liable for the illegal content they distribute to the extent that they that it can be shown that they knew what the content they distributed is. And so early, early court decisions looking at you know, liability for, for example, defamation uh, that occurred online, uh, we're, we're struggling with this concept of, you know, what are online platforms are they publishers such that they are liable for this for all of the speech that they that they you know make available on their platforms or are they or are they distributors such that they are liable for their for the illegal content only to the extent that it can be shown that they knew about it and you know two courts reached polar opposite decisions one court said they that one particular platform was a distributor because it allowed content on its platforms and did not engage with it much at all. Um, but another court distinguished that decision and, and decided that a, a platform known as Prodigy was a publisher because the platform actually moderated the content on its platform. And for that reason, the, that court reached the decision 
that the platform was therefore a publisher of all of the content on its on its platform and could therefore be liable for any of the content that appeared there. Um, and 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 that was my under, it, it's my understanding that was one of the motivating factors behind Section 230, um, where members of Congress, including Senator Wyden, who we just heard from, and Representative Chris Cox especially, took a look at that and they thought this could actually you know, make it much harder for users, for, for just general people to, to make their thoughts available on the internet if platforms are disincentivized from offering, you know, speech, from offering speech platforms pretty broadly. And it could also disincentivize platforms from making their platforms usable by curating an experience for their users and, and creating forums for, for specific purposes. Like if, if Facebook wants to be family friendly, they, they can do that by moderating the content on their platforms. If, if Reddit does not want to be family friendly, if they want to have particular forums that, that, are, for different, that are for different purposes or for adults only, then people can do that as well. Yeah. And, and, and the yeah. platform gets to decide, but if they were publishers of all of the speech of every user and they were incapable of identifying all of this speech, of identifying all of this speech before it went up, they, there was just too great of a liability risk. And, and sure. the concern on the part of members of Congress was that they could over that, that they could decide not to moderate content at all, which could which could have led to you know, a, a less usable internet. Right, right. And, and that's very useful context and, and you know, Senator Wyden said it himself, they were thinking about free expression and, and the First Amendment when they wrote the bill. Uh, we hear a lot about uh, what could not have been uh, anticipated by Congress when they wrote the Telecommunications Act of 96 or Section 230, but this very clearly was in the realm. I want to turn to Spencer um, Overton, the president of the Joint Center here. Uh, Spencer, nice shout out from Commissioner Starks on the Joint Center's work, uh, and of course your uh, research and scholarship in the area of of online speech is definitive. Uh, you have written some wonderful work on how voter suppression uh, by another name and by another technique uh, has popped up on the internet. And you have, uh, you've actually called for an update of section 230. Why don't you walk us through right now, Spencer, um, you know, what are we talking about in section 230? What are, what are these magic words? And, and if you had the pen, uh, how might you change uh, the statute so that uh, we don't have to deal with the scourge of voter suppression and, and anti-democratic uh, and, and hateful behavior on, on the net? Sure, Clint. Thank you so much for your leadership and for that of the National Urban League. Uh, Clint, uh, just to give some context in terms of you talked about voter suppression and what we're seeing. The, the Williams and Calvin Facebook page, it started operating as early as January 2016. Williams and Calvin purported to be two black men from Atlanta. They started out doing regular posts on police violence, mass incarceration, and other structural inequalities. And this allowed them to build a significant following among black users. And then, uh, on Election Day 2016, the operators of this Facebook page paid for and posted a Facebook ad. Uh, the creators of the ad selected Facebook advertising categories that would micro-target Black audiences, such as African American history or Malcolm X. Uh, and and in, in this is really the, the ad uh, that we saw it proclaimed. We don't have any other choice this time but to boycott the election. This time we choose between two races. No one represents black people. Don't go to vote. Now, after the election, Clint, an investigation revealed that the Williams and Calvin Facebook, Twitter and YouTube accounts were fake accounts set up and operated by the Russian Internet Research Agency. Uh, in 2016, the Russians erected Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, fake accounts targeted at various groups, right? The promoted division. But, but those accounts focused on black communities were unique because they discouraged voting. Uh, black communities were also heavily targeted. 
Uh, even though black folks are only 13 percent of the U.S. population, the Russians directed 38 percent of their U.S. Facebook ads toward African-Americans. And these clicks, these ads resulted in 50 percent of the user clicks. Uh, also in 2016, Clint, uh, the Trump campaign divided millions of Americans into several categories, and including a category, the campaign itself, called deterrence. And they micro-targeted the deterrence voters with tailored social media ads discouraging them uh, from voting uh, here. Uh, black voters were disproportionately singled out. So, for example, although African Americans account for only 22 percent of North Carolina's population, they were 46% of the North Carolina voters labeled as deterrents. Overall, the Trump campaign labeled 3.5 million black voters for deterrence. Now, we don't know the specific results of these efforts in terms of uh, discouraging black voters, but we do know that the 2016 presidential election marked the most significant decline in black voter turnout in modern history. Now, now, these efforts really seem to be uh, continuing uh, during uh, into 2020. During the Democratic presidential primary, uh, the Russians targeted black users with online disinformation about Senator Kamala uh, Harris. Uh, and then also in March 2020, Facebook and Twitter announced that they removed a network of Russian backed accounts that were uh, that originated in Ghana and Nigeria that targeted black communities in the U.S. This ad is from Ghana uh, here. Now, 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 Clint, some social media companies started to flag and correct uh, these these uh, lies here. So, for example, President Trump posted this tweet talking about his claim that mail-in ballots would be substantially fraudulent. In fact, there's a study that shows that only one out of 39,000 votes cast vote by mail uh, are problematic. A person's 13 times more likely to be struck by lightning at some point in life than commit voter fraud by mail. And so in response, Twitter didn't remove the president's tweet, but it flagged it. You see this uh, a blue flag at the bottom, get the facts about mail-in ballots uh, here, and it included a link to truthful facts. Now, in retaliation for this tweet, two days later, the Trump administration issued an executive order attempting to limit the protection of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. You'll remember that Section 30 gives, uh, 230 rather, gives a social media company the power to remove information that's obscene, excessively violent, or otherwise objectionable without risk of legal liability. In short, the Trump administration, and you see that red line of otherwise objectionable, they would eliminate the power of platforms to remove content that's otherwise objectionable. And like, Spencer, uh, the, yeah. the document we're seeing in front of us, the red line, these are the proposed changes by the Trump administration. Yes, Section by the Department of Justice. So the right. executive order instructed the Department of Justice and the NTIA to petition uh, the FCC, they, they instructed the DOJ to come up with some legislative language. So this is the red line right. from the Department of Justice. And so you see they cross out otherwise objectionable. So now if these proposals were adopted, companies could potentially risk legal liability for removing ads targeted at black users, telling them lies like you cannot vote if someone in your household has committed a crime. So in other words, these reforms make it more difficult for social media companies to engage in, uh, to, to, to pull down disinformation. Now, Section 230 does need to be reformed. We can talk about that a little more. There are some exceptions to Section 230. And, and my proposal is that when social media companies use ad targeting, to target housing ads or employment ads away from black or Latino communities and toward white communities right. or target voter suppression ads toward black communities that, you know, they should risk legal, legal liability because they're making a material contribution to the discrimination 
through that targeting. But the Trump proposals themselves are problematic because they make it more difficult to take down disinformation. So I, I want to put a pin in this discussion because there's some uh, there's some real world consequences to what we're talking about here with respect to uh, to black uh, speakers online as well as black content that we uh, create. So I want to turn to Dr. Danielle Brainbridge, uh, who is the host of or of the Origin of Everything that airs um, on uh, PBS. Uh, and a YouTube uh, series by the same name. So we want to welcome you, Dr. Brainbridge, uh, to this discussion. Now, your show, uh, which I am a, a recent subscriber to, me and a, a few hundred other thousand people in the world, uh, talks about topics like the role of racism and homophobia in the shaping of our laws, uh, all sorts of things about um, uh, our, our linguistics and uh, and our lexicon uh, for for black people. Tell us a little bit about how uh, Section 230 gives you a platform to reach audiences that you would not otherwise be able to to reach. You know, Senator Wyden talked about this. You know, when when he talked about uh, what was animating uh, the creation of Section 230. How does Section 230 help you get your voice out into the marketplace? Well, uh, thank you so much for having me today. I just want to echo all the other speakers. Thank you to the National Urban League for hosting this forum and for having this important conversation. Um, Section 230 does two important things for our channel. One is on the side of moderation. Um, and the other thing is on the side of uh, lowering the bar of entry so that we can have a bigger platform and voice. I think it's important, especially for a show like ours, which primarily airs on YouTube and then sometimes as interstitials on PBS and PBS.org, um, that YouTube as a platform allows us to create a show that is high quality, informative, educational, as well as free. That's a big uh, tenant of origin of everything is that we offer these services free to educators, to people from, we have teachers writing to us from as young as middle school age students to college students to postgraduate work. So our videos are supposed to be a resource to these communities. And I think if we had a situation where we were being suppressed or not allowed to post these uh, things freely, we wouldn't be able to offer that service quite as readily because traditional media is oftentimes more restrictive and as Kate was mentioning, has more liability issues around it. The second thing is that because we are a site that is hosted by me, I am a black person, quite obviously. Um, we oftentimes- We don't make assumptions here. You have to, <laughs> yeah. you have to say it out loud. Okay. I mean, gotcha. I'm always proud to say it, um, <laughs> but the targeting of our site sometimes comes from um, extremist groups or uh, people who are looking to agitate or post negative comments or hate speech in our uh, followings online. And we as moderators, as well as YouTube's community guidelines allows us to eliminate that kind of speech from our community. Because one of the things that's really important to us is that if a teacher wants to rely on us and think of us as a trusted source, or a parent wants to think of us as a trusted source for their children to learn something, I don't want them to open our channel and see excessive amounts of hate symbols, excessive amounts of violent speech, excessive amounts of things that could be harmful. So the ability to moderate and to keep things uh, regulated online, both with community guidelines that YouTube sets forward that catches a lot of these things in a net before they come onto our site, as well as the moderation that we do is really important to keep our site active and also a trusted site for learning. The, the president has been talking a lot recently about what is appropriate education uh, that's taught in our K through 12 and our colleges. And it's really sort of taken uh, a, a, an attack line on things like critical race theory uh, or an examination of our history that is, um, that, that is unflattering, but, but real and needs uh, to be uh, incorporated into our children's education. Um, has, has this, uh, this sentiment of <clears throat> making sure the kids are only taught a certain type of history or a certain type of philosophy is, is, are you feeling any of that, you know, in the content that you produce I any, any hostility toward it, or even people saying we can't air your programming anymore because it, it could threaten our, our federal funding, for instance. 
Um, so currently we haven't experienced any of those uh, issues, but I will say that on Origin of Everything, one of the things that I've been dedicated to as the primary writer and researcher of that show is presenting um, you know, fair, factual information. And I think as long as it's fair and it's factually true, it's fair game to put into our show. I know that people are nervous around the idea of airing certain content or approaching controversial subjects. But when I air a subject or I decide that we're going to do research or make an episode out of it, I always ask myself, what is the question that I'm asking my audience to learn? Um, what are the things I'd like them to take away from this? And ultimately, I think, um, because I myself have a degree in African-American studies, so I'm a student of critical race theory and of uh, African-American history, but I think it's important that these topics are thought of as productive. Um, they're thought of as benefiting the students that we, we teach. And it's also that there are lots of ugly and hateful chapters in American history. And we do a disservice to our students when we don't discuss them with accuracy. I don't think that there's any benefit in papering over them. So in terms of protections for our own site, um, I haven't experienced people you know, pushing back yet or teachers reaching out to us yet. Mostly what teachers are concerned about is, is this accurate? Can I trust you? And are you a trusted source that we can use in the classroom? Right. Well, uh, listen, I've really enjoyed a lot of the episodes that you've put on the air. And I sure hope that our, our listeners will, will subscribe to your, your channel. There's just some fascinating uh, work that's done there, his, historical and contemporary and otherwise. I, I want to get uh, Dr. Nicole Turner Lee from the Brookings uh, Institute involved in this discussion, because I, I feel like Senator Wyden may have been giving you a shout out, Nicole, even if it didn't uh, immediately hit you between the eyes. Uh, he, he was talking uh, at length about this notion of algorithmic bias. Uh, and and I'm, I, I want you to sort of explain, uh, based on the good work that you've done in this area, what, what is algorithmic bias and why are we talking about it in, in this discussion? Uh, it, 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 se it seemed to be one of the content moderation tools that some platforms are using. But, but why is it relevant here, especially for communities of color? Well, thank you, Clinton. Thank you to everybody for participating in this conversation. As I told Clint, I am so happy to see the Urban League as well as the Joint Center take on communications issues that actually speak to how important it is to have diverse voices at the table. Clint, I, I want to get into algorithms, but I, I just would be remiss if I didn't speak to, I think, what, some of the scholarship that we've heard from Spencer and Kate around how are we here? Why are we here? Right. I mean, first and foremost, I think Kate is completely right. We're here because we've been split between whether or not platforms are publishers or basically distribution outlets. Right. Mm -hmm. And Spencer is completely accurate that what we're actually experiencing now is this confusion has led to more and more misinformation and disinformation. And so why we're speaking about Section 230 today is because the GOP, particularly President Trump, wants an expedient way to not feel censored. And if we get down to the root of it, it's not about Section 230. It's about this very, you know, egregious action of civil dis in, um, injustice against people of color, the LGBTQ community and others who speak in ill words around this administration. So, I mean, I think we need to just be clear and, you know, as a shout out, I think everybody needs to vote. You want to be involved with this, you got to go out and vote. Now, Absolutely. with that being said, I think what we're hearing, and Danielle, I'm so um, really taken by your words because what you're speaking to is whatever we do with this, it's going to affect the intermediaries, the people like Danielle, who actually are in some way sheltered as a result of Section 230 or have the ability to exercise their own opinions because, you know, in many respects, the platform companies are sort of indemnified, right, from what people do as a publisher or as, as Kate said, or as a distribution outlet, right? But at the end of the day, what we have to also realize that this is a, con this is a conversation around conduct versus content. And why is it that people of color are particularly interested in this right now? It is because we as people of color need more voices for content. We have already seen the dismissal of black media, of black radio, of newspapers, et cetera. And now we have dominant platforms who have become the private public square for where conversations are basically discussed and where truths are arbitrated. So let's just, let's just start there. 
Secondly, why do we care? Because as people of color and communities that have been marginalized, we want what's called responsible free speech. We don't want you to put out free speech that may land up with us being killed or us being, you know, in some respect, just ill demeaned with further hate speech, with further acts of violence. You know, the thing that hit me when Spencer put up a tweet is when the president was actually put out there, the fact that the thugs are out there, you know, sort of draw your guns and go out there and fight. You know, not only was that misconduct on the behalf of an administration, but it also suggested it was OK to actually kill us and to hurt us. And I think there's this idea that you can have free speech, but you shouldn't be socially responsible in terms of how you divvy that out. Because there have been groups, as Spencer suggested, that have already litigated and mitigated these threats. We've already marched to be safe. We should not have to have platforms actually be the ones that allow people to air these dirty grievances. And I think the other issue that's part of the problem for against algorithms is the fact that because we're in this sweet spot right now, where our civil liberties have basically been on a, t a front and attacked over the last four years. Because people have to remember, Obama had a lot of hate speech. I mean, let's not get it twisted. You know, he actually, as a president, had the most hate speech. I, I forget the rule, and somebody could correct me later, but by the 10th comment, usually on his, um, his Facebook page was something hateful, right? And for many people doing civil rights work, it's usually the 10th comment that you'll start seeing, you know, the real hateful person come out. The bottom line is this, right? We've got to figure out a way of how do we move forward with platform accountability, particularly among platforms do, that do not have transparent content moderation processes. So the thing that strikes me about this conversation is yes, we don't want to incite violence and we want platforms to uh, uh, responsibly sort of provide law enforcement to those groups that put out incendiary uh, speech. But at the same token, we don't want to be as black nationalists or LGBTQ activists censored as well, right? And so we're sort of in the middle of this. How do we also maintain our ability to say the things that we need to say without being taken down? And that's a lot of what happens in the content moderation process. So to your point, Clint, how do algorithms tie into this? First and foremost, I want to share a very simple, simple explanation, and I'm going to be quiet because you all know I can talk. <laughs> First and foremost, I want you to imagine what it was like to be on the playground at school. There were the monkey bars, the slide, the sandbox, the, you know, whatever you played on, it was there. And as a child, sometimes you found a way to go from the slide to the sandbox, the sandbox to the monkey bars. That was democracy. In social media or in platforms, this is something else that's happening. The white supremacists are on the slide. The Black Lives Matter people are in the sandbox. The lifestyle enthusiasts may actually be on the monkey bars. And it is our affinity groups, our likes, our taste, our interests, the content that we want to see that rises to the top. That is what's considered in many cases to be algorithmic amplification. And as Spencer talked about it, platforms are really you know, not much more than optimized marketing platforms that actually have figured out how to micro-target us by our lifestyles, interests, and our backgrounds, despite not asking us our race. And when you think about the sandbox of democracy, the white supremacists on the monkey bars or the conservatives on the monkey bars, the Black Lives Matter people on the slide, you need somebody that's going to be effective in either moderating content where everybody gets fair play, or you need to understand that you are not on a playground that is fair and that they, you will be on the same platform as a black nationalist, as someone who's a white supremacist or a, a civil rights activist, you know, on the playground with somebody who spews, you know, anti-LGBT rhetoric. And I share that because we have not, as we've talked about Section 230, talked about the power of algorithmic amplification and its ability to create this type of polarization that lends itself to what I believe conservatives are actually talking to. Three years ago on INDR, I was at a conservative um, think tank meeting and this conversation came up. We don't think that Facebook is fair because the, anti the conservatives never get enough airtime. And I turned to that person, I said, well, we don't think that Facebook is fair for the Black Lives Matter people because we don't get enough airtime. <laughs> and when you go back and forth on this, Right. Based on what you see and what you hear. The bottom line is it's been explained. We need a multiplicity of voices within these platforms environments and we need content moderation strategies 
that are very clear of the role of the algorithm in amplifying particular forms of speech to particular communities, right? Because again, it's a contained space in which we actually operate. And honestly, we need people who look like the folks on this meeting <laughs> to play a role in the content moderation strategies so that even if we reform section 230 and we actually decided on Trump's side or to not do anything about it at all, we're still got the same problems because the lack of diversity, and this kind of goes with what Spencer's talking about, I love what Spencer, how he framed it. The lack of any type of understanding of the potential for discrimination, the potential for you know racial violence or the normalization of racial violence places people of color to be more susceptible and vulnerable to the egregious actions that actually happen on platforms. And so, you know, Clint, I, I know I needed to answer that last question, but I, I would be remiss because as a person who has studied media ownership, the reason we are having this conversation in such pure form as black and Latina and, you know, brave people and people of different sexual orientations is because these platforms, as Danielle said, have allowed for a lower barrier to entry, but yet, they're still perceived as stopping the uh, on ramps of other groups. <laughs> right. And I think we got to go back and really consider what is at the intent of this type of re assessment and reevaluation. Right. And 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 I want to put a pin in in this algorithm piece because I, I I want you to talk more about it. But I want to get to um, my brother David Johns, the uh, executive director of the National Black Justice Coalition. Uh, David, you represent a, a very unique voice, not only in the marketplace of voices, but in the marketplace of black voices. And I want to talk a little bit about your experience as a leader using social media to educate and spread truth about justice issues related to the intersectionality of race and identity and, and how would a change to the rules around content moderation, um, how would that affect social justice movements generally, but, but your organization in, in particular? Yeah, I appreciate the question and the opportunity to be in community with these brilliant leaders, uh, colleagues and friends among them. Um, and thank you to the Urban League for your continued leadership, especially in this area. Uh, for those who do not know, um, I am the executive director of the National Black Justice Coalition. We are the nation's only national civil rights organization that is both intentional and unapologetic and standing in the intersections of racial equity and LGBTQIA plus equality. Um, and so to Nicole's point about the ways in which certain groups are often targeted, what we acknowledge is the importance of intersectionality, um, understanding that that's something that so many members of our community and of our country hold in their being. Uh, and the kindergarten teacher in me loves not only this conversation, but Nicole's analogy about the playground. Uh, and what I think about is that, right, if, if I had the ability to teach, <laughs> we wouldn't be having these discussions because the ability to navigate democracy and to create environments where everyone feels safe is something that good kindergarten teachers learn to do well. And so uh, let me paint uh, or add some more color to this picture and answer your question specifically, Clint, of like, what is the cost of all of this? And I want to step back and highlight a couple of things. The confusion that Nicole mentioned in talking about and tethering together what Spencer, Kate, and Danielle have mentioned means at this very moment that those who have power, and in particular those who are advertisers and those who otherwise have power based on um, property um, or personal relationships, knowing uh, an executive or founder of one of these platforms is a particular form of power in this moment. Um, they get to control um, uh, what speech looks like. Um, uh, they get to skirt rules, existing rules around protections uh, for hate speech. Um, and they get to uh, essentially, uh, as Danielle pointed out, uh, make up whatever facts are truths about reality that they would like for people to believe. Um, and they are able to leverage existing tools tools uh, per platforms to target particular communities who are disadvantaged. And I want to be clear that individuals who are members of racial and ethnic minority groups, as well as individuals who are uh, living with disabilities, who are LGBTQIA+, who are poor, who are housing disabled, who have a relationship with the prison industrial complex, are impacted in uh, extreme ways. And so the short answer to your question is, uh, with the content moderation that y'all's president would like to see, I want to be clear, Clint, when you started talking about the president, I was like, what has Barack Hussein Obama said recently? But with the changes that y'all's president would like to have us all see, I would not be able to do my job. I want to be clear that in this very moment, 
leading a organization that is at the intersections of things that are often flagged for things connected to anti-Blackness or LGBTQIA bias is already incredibly difficult. In the last month alone, I have attempted to place ads around three significant events, one of them, National Gay Men's HIV AIDS Awareness Day. What we know is that since the introduction of the HIV AIDS epidemic in the late 80s, black people have been disproportionately affected. So much of why black people are still dying as a result of HIV, in spite of the medical and social advancements that we've seen, is a result of the stigma, the misinformation that exists about the drugs, about the virus, about the ways in which people can be undetectable and otherwise live happy, healthy lives and thrive. But because platforms are so worried about the prospect of being sued, every time we try and post an act, it's flagged. And we ultimately end up missing out the opportunity to message critically important stuff to members of our community. I'll give you right. another one. What we know is that since this administration has taken office in uh, 2016, the suicide rates for black kids have increased. Bullying for LGBTQIA students has also increased. To be clear, we don't have data that highlights intersectionality, but qualitatively, we know that students who are at the intersections of both of those suffer in extreme ways. Recently, just last week, there was Spirit Day, a day designed to raise awareness about bullying and violence that young people face. The ads that we tried to place to highlight the importance of protecting LGBTQIA students of color were flagged by platforms who are concerned about being sued. Now, mind you, all of this, right, these, these, these desires to try and give messages, critically important messages to communities, to try and increase cultural competence, to create spaces that are safe and affirming, all of this is being stifled. While there are other accounts, the current occupant of the Oval Office is able to send tweets filled with misinformation to millions of people. And so what we have to be clear about is that often these conversations come down to um, uh, an opaque conversation about free speech and the, the uh, uh, free safety, our, our safety for everyone. And I want us to honor what Nicole mentioned in terms of responsible free speech and democratized use of these platforms. To go back to where Spencer started, it is critically important for myself and for my colleagues who do work on behalf of communities that often don't have the ability to understand how, how any of this stuff is come into being, let alone what a single line change to a particular statue might mean for them, right? Like this is about those of us who have the ability to stand in the gap to do so for communities who need it most. The last example I will offer is this. I don't care what your personal feelings about sex work are. Platforms have provided historically safe spaces for individuals who engage in sex work for whatever reason to be able to do so safely. What we have seen is since these changes have been proposed and platforms are responding to them preemptively, there is a lack of those safe spaces. And so living in 2020, where in October, we've seen more black trans women murdered than we've seen since people have started to collect the data, we should be concerned about the fact that these changes affect the real lives of people who often get erased when we talk about data and statistics. And in particular, while we're talking about the importance of black lives, we should all understand that those of us who have skin that's been kissed by the sun and the privilege of knowing what it means to be black and have double consciousness and the ability to see things that other people wish that they could see will continue to be most harmed by platforms that are not allowed to moderate content in ways that we know will support democracy. Uh, that's that's brilliant, David. Um, and, and I wanna make sure in this moment, and I'm looking at this wonderful array of experts <laughs> in front of me. And I think the reason we're having this event is because black voices have been largely missing from a lot of the venues where we need to be. You know, I look uh, at you, Kate, uh, you are in the United States federal courts, state courts, uh, on, on First Amendment issues. I, I imagine you will be uh, in, in court soon uh, fighting um, whatever comes out of what the FCC does or what the FTC does. Uh, the question I'd like to pose to everyone here as we wrap is, please talk directly to the folks in the Urban League movement and the people listening to this event and tell them where we should be and how we should be lending our voice to this discussion, whether it's in Congress or whether it's in the courts or whether it's on uh, on, on programs, where should we be? And I, I want to start with you, Kate, uh, to, to quickly tell us wh where, where should our listeners be in this in this um, on this issue? Um, 
Well, I, I'm, I was very moved by what David just said, to be perfectly honest. Um, so I'm sitting with that. So it's like, we, we all need a little time <laughs> to digest that and to let that uh, absorb, right? Yeah. That's, that's David. That's, that's why you never go after David. <laughs> it's at all possible. <laughs> so, Kate. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a privilege to, to even try to follow that. So I, <laughs> I think that I think that where I think I think I have I have two I have two things that I, are takeaways for me uh, when it comes to when it comes to Section two hundred and thirty. One is as as has been made clear by every single person that has spoken, content moderation is already a problem. It already embodies the systemic bias that exists in our society, and it amplifies it. Right? It is already an issue. And it is something that we need to press the platforms on consistently and repeatedly transparency to begin and, and real meaningful accountability and appealability when, when censorship happens, um, especially, especially disproportionately to persons of color and to people at the intersections, as, as David was pointing out. Any changes to 230 have the could have the the effect of amplifying that that existing bias and making it worse. And I think the Earn It Act is a good example of that, where it ostensibly would change Section 230 to eliminate it with respect to child sexual abuse material. But what will really happen is the communities that David represents will be harmed even more than they are already being harmed by content moderation because platforms feeling, fearing liability are not, go, are not going to take on that legal risk in order to protect sex workers or in order to protect people in the margins. They are going to over moderate that content. They are going to silence those communities and they are going to push those communities into even further danger than they are already in. So every time we are talking about amending 230, we need to be thinking about those negative externalities because it is the people in, it, it is the people at the intersections and the people of color and the people in marginalized communities that are going to be most affected by it. And the other thing I think we need to all, always be considering when we're thinking about amending 230 is what does 230 actually protect? So when we're considering algorithmic bias, for example, a lot of the algorithmic bias and a lot of the algorithmic decision-making, those decisions are not made by users. They are made by the platforms in themselves. And it is the platforms that are, as, as Spencer pointed out, already materially contributing to, dis to discriminatory activity, to the discriminatory delivery of ads for housing, employment, and credit, for example. Those are decisions that are made by the platforms and therefore likely are not the information, provi information content provided by another information content provider. They are the right. content of the platforms okay. in a lot of cases, or they, they are a material contribution to what makes the content itself illegal. And so when we're considering changing 230, I, want to, I, want, I think we need to be very clear about what 230 does not protect. Right. When we're when we're thinking about that, because I often think that the algorithmic bias question, it, it may not even apply in right. certain scenarios. Right. And, and because of the negative externalities of changing 230, we have to be real. We, in my view, we have to be very, very careful yep. about let, about both of those things. Let, let me turn to Dr. Bainbridge. Um, where where should audiences be right now and what should they be doing in this moment? Well, I think first and foremost is to be rigorous in the fact checking that you're doing about the content that you consume. There's lots of misinformation that's being disseminated that's been discussed on this platform. And I think if you can have a sense of where things are coming from, what the source is, if you can trust them, that's really important. Um, you can't rely on these platforms to be doing all the work for you or doing that work for you. And the second thing I would say is Oftentimes people who are on the creative side of things or making um, content in any sort of uh, creative way, they think that these policy issues are kind of sort of theoretical, they're above their head, they don't have to do with you. Uh, what you are doing is a creative thing and that is couldn't be further from the truth. Inform yourself on the policy, inform yourself on what's happening, stay up to date on these current issues and also make sure that you are protecting the content that you are distributing. Brilliant. I think um, Brilliant. it's important to remember that even if you're in the creative fields, 
that policy infects you, it impacts you, it impacts the work that you do, and you need to be able to, to collaborate with other people and figure out how you can, can move the needle. Professor Overton, your thoughts. Yes, thanks so much, uh, Clint. Um, so I think the first and most immediate thing is right now we've got an administration that's essentially working the refs by making threats to 230. They're basically discouraging platforms from taking down suppressive uh, content, disinformation, et cetera, by making these threats about 230. So the platforms need to hear from other people when they see disinformation or when they see problematic material, they need to hear from alternative sides. So that's number one, reporting disinformation to platforms, uh, to election protection, to other folks and not sharing disinformation. Uh, clear in information in this election season, both before the election and after the election when votes are being tabulated is very, very important. So that's number one. Number two, recognizing that voter suppression and civil rights, they're not, it's not a conservative versus liberal issue. Many of these platforms try to tee it up like, okay, you've got the Republicans over here talking about anti-conservative bias, and over here you've got civil rights groups here, like there's the polar opposite. No, civil rights, it's not a Republican or a, a liberal uh, issue uh, here. It's not a political issue uh, here. And so being very clear about that, I think something else that's important is recognizing this business model. This business model is about clicks and eyeballs. And uh, so companies following the market will say, hey, if there is stuff that is suppressive, stuff that's disinformation, this actually might be good for eyeballs and for revenue, and they need there to be a pushback. So if we think about the reason these companies don't promote adult pornography is because they can't advertise against it. Basically, advertisers and companies don't generally advertise uh, against it. So the market will drive them in a particular uh, direction. And we need to say, this is unacceptable content here that suppress suppression, other things to be on this, this platform. The First Amendment problem is not taking down disinformation. The First Amendment problem is the federal government threatening private actors saying, uh, you've got to have my disinformation up uh, in order to uh, stay in business. That is uh, the First Amendment problem. And finally, and I don't know if Kate and I are in different places or the same place on this, I, I'm a big believer in 230. I think it's important, but I do think we need an exception. We've got an exception for intellectual property. Why should the movie studios have an exception, but civil rights don't? We've got an exception for federal criminal law. I think there should be an exception for civil rights violations where uh, social media companies target uh, employment, or housing ads away from black folks and toward white folks or when they target voter suppression ads at black communities. They're making money and they are being a part of the discrimination. They're being material participants here. I think that's the way the law actually works right now, but I think Congress actually needs to be explicit and right in that exception. And there are no bills floating around Congress right now that create that exception. Um, as I understand it. So we need to really slow down what's going on in Congress uh, and make sure that these, these concerns are addressed. I wanna thank you, uh, Spencer, for flagging that. And I wanna to turn to, to Dr. Turner Lee and David Johns uh, to close this out. And, um, and, and the same question to you or, or in any message you'd like to impart to our, our listeners. Well, I, I know we're running out of time, so I'll try to be quick because I know David's gonna talk a little longer than I am. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about that. You can't, I'll you be can't, the judge. I'll be the judge no. of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, first and foremost, Clint, I want to say thank you again for having this conversation. And I sure. do believe as we move forward, what should Urban League folks really hear from this message? You know, one, you got to get into the conversation, right? These issues have 
rippling effects on our ability to express ourselves, to express our movements, to express our values, like Danielle was talking about, to get into places where we have not historically been able to actually penetrate. So I think that any person that is out there that needs to learn more about this, go to the internet, but look at this webinar as areas in which you need to actually further explore. I do want to say that I'm in total agreement with Spencer. In fact, Spencer, I've got in my mind something that we should write together because I think this whole like thing around where civil rights applies in the digital space is sort of dismissed. And that applies also to the algorithmic bias area, which Kate also mentioned. And I think it's about time that we have to understand that this is not an era of permissionless forgiveness. Sorry, you didn't get that job. Sorry, you didn't see that housing uh, ad. Sorry, this, sorry, that. Those days of break things and fix them later, they're over because they have full-fledged consequences that actually limit the ability of people of color to actually exercise freely and democratically in the society. So I think that's really right on, Spencer, with regards to figuring out what that exception may be. I think overall, Clint, I would just say this. I think the administration is on to something, right? They are on to the fact that they want speech privileged in ways that benefit their establishment. And I think it's important that we also think about, as everybody has said, you know, who are these platform companies? What are they trying to become? And how dangerous it is to actually put that precedence in place so that we actually favor one side of speech over the other, because ultimately that's where it will land up. And so I think it's important that we actually continue to debate that premise. And we think about potentially not repealing all of Section 230, but thinking about what other adjustments need to be made, what other exceptions need to be made to make it fair and equitable. I think the second thing is it's important for us to hold platforms accountable, like Kate said, just because you know, platforms could actually become this new public square doesn't mean that everything is all good. Um, and I think it's important, as David has suggested, that we continue to push platforms on accountability and we exercise some type of law enforcement, whether it be through Section 230 or something else, to demonstrate that this is above the line activity. It's not the typical transactional activity that we're used to. And then finally, I would just say this, Part of this conversation really is reflecting the fact that the lived experiences of populations that are of color, that have this wonderful ambience of not necessarily being marginalized, but just being different. They're not reflected in the experiences of the people who are moderating the content. They're not reflective in the people who are putting these platforms together. And if those lived experiences are not reflected, we are always going to see, as people have said, this push down on the liability. Well, what if we get in trouble because of X? You gotta bring people to the team. You gotta bring people to the table. You've gotta acknowledge, as James Baldwin says, that America has a beautiful landscape of, of history that we've developed, but we also have an ugly conscience. And that ugly conscience is real. And it shows up in these digital platforms in ways that we never anticipated. So I would just yeah. say, you know, for NUL folks, get in the game and find a, find a chair, pull it up to the table and start talking about these issues, particularly when you look at our sister friend, Danielle, who is trying to make sure that she's able to be authentic in her truth online. David, I, I saw you writing something and, and I know you're gonna be able to find the one word that is gonna close us out and you're gonna make everybody look bad for droning on. This is gonna be one elegant, uh -uh, perfect that's not gonna happen. word. No, not Go. gonna happen, <laughs> not gonna happen. I'm gonna be quick though. I wanna remind everyone that um, systems, uh, including digital platforms work exactly as they're designed to. Um, and we should be clear about that, right? Uh, this has everything to do with colonial models of thinking um, and attempts to oppress progressive forms of thought that are um, referenced in critical race theories are in other platforms. My three things are to join something. Uh, so f uh, subscribe to Danielle's platform, join the ACLU, join the Joint Center, follow Nicole and the work she does at Brookings, and follow NBJC in part because we do this uh, daily uh, and encourage you to connect with the existing efforts rather than starting from scratch. And again, we're talking to the Urban League, so we're having a conversation with the congregation. We just added additional things to the, to the things that y'all can do. The second thing is to call your elected officials. As has been mentioned, there is not legislation that responds to the concerns that we've articulated or discussed. That should be developed and we should ensure that our members know that this is an issue that we care about. Um, and then the last thing is to take it to the platforms. Uh, each of us have the ability right now to record a video, to send a tweet, um, to post a TikTok, um, to do anything on any of the platforms that we otherwise enjoy to raise awareness um, so that people know that these things are happening and that it's important for us to get engaged such that we can all be free, um, not just in real life, but also digitally as well. Bless you, my brother. I love you. I want to thank all of our panelists for your time today. I want to thank Senator Ron Wyden, 
Commissioner Jeffrey Starks and the members of the Urban Solutions Council, again, uh, whose generosity makes programming like this possible. I want to thank Google for their support of the podcast, for the movement, and for the use of the t YouTube platform today. Have a wonderful day and get involved. Thank you.